Hi, I'm Jade and I'm a junior doctor in the Seven Deanery. This is the second part of two revision videos on the most common obstetric emergencies. In this video, we will cover umbilical cord prolapse, shoulder dystocia, amniotic fluid embolism, and cardiac arrest in pregnancy. Cord prolapse is when the umbilical cord descends through the cervix before the fetus following rupture of the amniotic membranes. If the cord is compressed or if it spasms, the blood supply to the fetus is blocked and this can cause hypoxia which can result in many complications such as cerebral palsy or even death. On examination, the cord may be palpated vaginally or may even be visible the fetal heart rate may be abnormal on CTG. Risk factors for cord prolapse include polyhydramnios, multiparity, breech position, prematurity, and a long umbilical cord. Management of cord prolapse involves elevating the presenting part of the fetus back into the uterus manually or filling the bladder to prevent compression of the umbilical cord but the umbilical cord itself must not be pushed back inside, rather it should be kept warm and moist to prevent vasospasm. There should be minimal handling of the umbilical cord. Tocolytics such as tuberculine may be administered to reduce contractions and delay the delivery of the fetus, thus preventing compression of the cord. The woman should either bring her knees up to her chest or go into the knee chest face down position to prevent cord compression even further. Immediate C-section should be arranged and carried out. Next, let's talk about shoulder dystocia. Shoulder dystocia is when, after the delivery of the fetal head, the anterior fetal shoulder gets stuck behind the maternal pubic symphysis. The posterior shoulder gets stuck on the sacral promontory Prolonged delivery can result in hypoxia of the fetus, while traction can result in injury of the baby's brachial plexus, leading to irreversible damage and lifelong disability. Can you remember what deformity results from an upper brachial plexus injury? Herb's palsy, or the waiter's tip position, describes a medially rotated upper limb with pronation of the forearm and weak flexion of the wrist. Risk factors for shoulder dystocia include macrosomia, high maternal BMI, prolonged labour and augmentation of labour with oxytocin. Shoulder dystocia can be recognised by the turtleneck sign, which is where the fetal head retracts back into the pelvis. The delivery will also be prolonged and following extension of the fetal neck to deliver the head, the fetus remains in this occipital anterior position. These are all signs of shoulder dystocia, which is an obstetric emergency. Therefore, you must call for help and advise the mother to stop pushing. First line manoeuvres for the management of shoulder dystocia include McRoberts and suprapubic pressure. McRoberts involves getting the mother to bring her knees to her chest and to stop pushing. This widens the pelvic outlet and leaves room for the shoulder to dislodge. Suprapubic pressure involves pushing behind the baby's anterior shoulder to help disimpact it from the maternal symphysis. If these first line manoeuvres are unsuccessful, internal manoeuvres must be used. An episiotomy is sometimes done to allow better access for internal manoeuvres. One option is delivering the posterior arm and another is internal rotation of both shoulders while applying suprapubic pressure. Next, let's talk about amniotic fluid embolism. An amniotic fluid embolism is caused by amniotic fluid entering into the maternal bloodstream suddenly during or immediately after labour or C-section resulting in sudden cardiovascular collapse. It is very rare, but also has a very high mortality rate, so you should be aware of it. Some risk factors include high maternal age, induction of labour, C-section and instrumental delivery. The initial phase of the disease is characterised by respiratory symptoms due to pulmonary edema. These symptoms include breathlessness, 
chest pain and anxiety. The second stage is characterized by cardiovascular changes secondary to left-sided cardiac failure. Patients may experience collapse, drowsiness and chills. They can appear cyanosed. Finally, hemorrhagic complications may occur like severe hemorrhage, bruising and DIC. Management is predominantly supportive, involving maintaining ventilation, correcting coagulopathy, hemodynamic monitoring and preventing organ failure. You should assess the patient using an A to E approach and involve your seniors really early on. Finally, I will cover a few points about cardiac arrest in pregnancy. Although it is extremely rare, it is a special circumstance in the Resus UK guidelines, which are part of the Advanced Life Support Guidelines. Cardiac arrest in pregnant women can be caused by reversible causes like hemorrhage, PE, amniotic fluid embolism, and eclampsia. Early identification and treatment can prevent cardiac arrest. Some important considerations to remember with regards to cardiac arrest in pregnancy include follow a systematic approach. A to E is key. Involve your seniors early on and also bleep the obstetricians and neonatal specialists. Make sure to give oxygen and fluid boluses if there are any signs of hypotension or hypovolemia. Prepare for emergency C-section in case resuscitation fails. When there is risk of or clear hemodynamic instability, position the woman in the left lateral tilt or you can manually displace the uterus to the left to decrease compression of the IVC. CPR is as normal but with the left lateral tilt using a Cardiff wedge or firm pillows. Early intubation is needed to decrease the risk of aspiration of gastric contents as there is an increased risk of this in pregnancy. Thanks for watching.